Hey, everybody. Um, this is Steve. I'm going to be having a little hangout on math today. I invited a bunch of people. I don't know where they're at, but we got EO who actually teaches math. So he's going to be my um, my go-to kind of guy as we follow through on this a little bit and discuss what a Taylor series is, um, kind of how to find what the Taylor series is for, for e to the x and why the derivative of e to the x is equal to e to the x. Now, let me reiterate before I start this. Um, I am not a math guy. This is a layperson's attempt at this to explain it. Although I've had it before, it's been several, several years. So do not take my, what I'm going to say is gospel. Um, this is not a rigorous proof, and it is circular in some ways because I have to assume the derivative um, exists for e to the x is e to the x by, by coming up with the Taylor series. And so the first three pages that I have for this as we go through it, it's circular. I get this. I understand that. This is not rigorous. But the only way I could really try to explain to people why this works, and that's my whole goal is explain what is actually we're trying to do, what is a Taylor series, and how does it get us to where we want to go, and why taking the derivative of that. The proof that I'm going to use is a very informal proof. It's not, it's not, it's not sound enough to be used in a rigorous form. I have talked to, you know, I looked at a PhD in math, look it over. Um, we've already discussed these issues. I was wearing them beforehand. But this is just for, for educational purposes. Um, it's a heuristic. It's so, a useful heuristic. It's heuristic. Yeah. I, you know, I like the way you put that. It's heuristic. So it's conceptual. Um, so the link to, to come in is out there. If you play, a few people have it, um, I, I don't, I, I don't want to look to other things as I'm going through this cause I'll um, it's be hard enough to focus on this. So if anybody has a link like EO or, or drag, or I give it to Jade, give it out to Hogtie, whoever else, um, uh, who wants in. So anyways, we're going to, we're going to jump right into us. Um, I'm going to be screen sharing. I'm actually going to be pulling some things over from different screens here. And then I'm going to be showing you kind of what we're going to be doing here. So let me screen share. Da, da, da. OK, present. So make sure the outside chat can actually see this. Uh, make sure it's clear. Make sure it's, it's large enough where they can see it. I'm going to blow it up a little bit here. Um, and then we're going to see where we're actually starting from. And then while, whoop, while we're doing that, I'm going to put the video over here. I don't need that. And I need the live. i got to find the live chat so I can at least see. Yeah, one sec. Let me, let me get organized here. Where's my live chat? I, I lost my live chat. Dun, dun, dun. There it is. Okay. Okay, perfect. So let me know on the outside chat if you can see this. Basically, this is going to be what we're going to be doing. This is actually a graph right here of the function e to the x. Okay, and Hopefully, you guys know what a function is. A function is just basically you put something in, you get something out. So the e to the x curve, it looks like this. Most people who have ever worked with an exponential is going to recognize this curve. It's, it's, it's found everywhere. It's found in compound interest. It's found in uh, decay rates. Now, there is a more rigorous way to actually get what we're doing. Um, is using limits and integration. I'm not going to be going that route because this is complicated enough and I don't want to confuse people and I haven't fully um, got that down where I'm comfortable enough to, to do it that way. So just kind of bear with me on that. But I just want to give you conceptually what we're going to be doing and then show you the math behind it. So what we want to do is we want to approximate the value of E using a Taylor series over and over again until there's a convergence of, on something. There's a convergence of what the value of E is. And each, each, each der uh, derivative we take is going to get us closer to, co closer to that result. So we, we've discussed what a derivative is before. And in this particular case, if we take the, the, the zeroth derivative of a function is, is defined to be that function. So if I have the zero de derivative of e to the x, it is e to the x. It is the function. So that applies to anything. But the first derivative, if we take the act, if we actually plot it out, when we when we do the Taylor series, which we see, we're going to get different terms. The first term we're going to get is a one uh, plus x. Then we're going to get these other terms. So don't don't worry too much what these mean. We look at the the function, the plot that we're looking at. Oh wait, uh, Steve, we're not showing over here. Uh, Wildheart can see it. Quartermaster, you can't. Um, I'm looking at it on the on my TV right now on the uh, uh, Xbox uh, uh, YouTube app. So I can see somewhat. I can't see the stuff on the on the far left, the buttons. Um, which screen am I sharing here? Uh, I see the the graph that you showed me. Okay, yeah, now I can see more of it. There we go. Steve, do you mind if I just give them a second of background about why we're using Taylor series? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, by all means. So, awesome. 
the theory is if we have a sufficiently well-behaved function and well-behaved in this context means infinitely differentiable and a little more, but you know, uniform convergence, that kind of thing. Basically what we're going to do is this, we want to approximate our function e to the x, which is called a transcendental function, but that's another story. We want to approximate it with these polynomials because polynomials are friendly critters. We know how to use them. And so what we're going to do is first, we're going to say, okay, what's the first step in approximating our function? Let's use a polynomial that agrees with one point, the point we're centering on the, the power series. The next step is, okay, let's make this a little more uh, form fitting. Let's say that the derivative agrees at this point, then the second derivative, the third derivative, etc. Now, if this process works, eventually you're going to get in the limit, you're going to get e to the x by the power series. So that's the theory. You start with yeah. agree. You start with the function agreeing with the e to the x at one point. Then the derivative agrees. The second derivative agrees, etc. Ad infinitum. And we have to make certain assumptions that we can actually take the derivative for each um, each each um, term, and we have have to take the um, the, the uh, way we can actually find a coefficient each one. So I'm going to show you those assumptions. But so the, this for the first derivative, we end up with a tangential line on one point of the function, which is right here, evaluated at zero. This is where we're going to be evaluating it from. Is from the zero, the x equals zero. But as you can see now, this kind of gives us an idea of what the function is doing, but it's very coarse. It's not refined by any stretch of the imagination, right? Because we want to get it to 2.7, um, what is the value of E? 2.7185, something, if I remember correctly. 2.7182818, and then it changes. There you go. So we want to get as close to that as possible. Right now, we're not really near that. We're at one something, right? So this is not going to get us where we want to go to get a good approximation. The next derivative they're going to be taking, right, is going to give us a little bit more approximation. So we have the zeros derivative, the first derivative, the second derivative, which are going to give us a parabola, okay? And the parabola, if you guys remember, when you have a, a, a x to the squared, it gives us a parabola type shape. This is a little more form fitting. If you look here, this is actually following our initial e to the x curve, a little bit more approximate, right? It's going to be a little bit closer to our, our function. Now, when we take the third one, it's going to get a little bit closer. I mean, this is almost spot on. And then as we take the fourth and the fifth, it's going to get closer and closer. These are closer approximations. Each time we add another term, we're going to get closer and closer to the e to the x function. That's the goal. So when you add all these, when you add up all these things together, you're going to get closer and closer. So we start off with, with basically the original function, which is f to the zero, the first derivative, which is going to give us the line, the second derivative is going to give us a parabola, the third derivative is going to give us this uh, kind of shape. If, every time you see a cube, actually the cube, you're always going to see something similar to this, where it approaches up from the the left and it goes upwards and then continues on. And then the fifth, and then, of course, the sixth. And then, again, as you, you do more and more terms, you're going to get closer and closer. And the goal is to take an infinite amount of, of, of terms and take a summation of that. Now, we cannot do that, obviously, in finite time. So there's mathematical processes of how we're going to take an infinite summation and get a result that will give us the, the actual function we're get, looking for, which is e to the x here. Okay? So we're going we're gonna to go right, right into it. <laughs> We're going, to, we're going to try to get the derivative e to the x and show why it actually is e to the x. And we have to make certain assumptions to form the Taylor series to begin with to explain to you why the Taylor series for e to the x is what it is. And so this is circular. I want people to, to understand that. This is not a formal proof. This is circular. Um, I get that. But this is the only way I can really explain it in a way without involving more intricate processes to get coefficients and other things. So we're going to make two very, very simple assumptions. One that the power series, okay, and the power series is the Taylor series. We're going to an exponent, right? We're raising something, so it's a power series. That it's going to be about x to the n, and I'll explain that. And that a derivative can be found for every order. And what we mean by an order, we mean uh, a zero order derivative is the function, right? So if I have uh, x, the function is x. The second, the the first derivative would be. Uh, the, the first order, the second derivative would be the second order, and so on. So we, we have to make sure for this to work that each derivative exists for every order there is in the, in the, in the, in the expansion. So those are two assumptions we have to make in order to make this work. Um, I think by now we've kind of co covered what derivatives are. We, we did this with, with um, Midnight the other day. He was, very, he was spot on about it. I said, okay, let's take a, a function. We'll just take a, a polynomial and let's 
just take different derivatives of it. Um, drag, for example, if I have x squared, what was the derivative? You said x squared. Mm -hmm. This would be a uh, 2x. Okay, and then you take that. that so the, the zeroth derivative of, of x squared is the function, right? So the zeroth derivative is x squared, right? Oh, the zero. Okay, yeah, yeah. Zero okay. derivative, yeah. The first derivative yeah. would be the one you just said, right? 2x. Yeah. Now take the second derivative. So and it'd be two. just two. It, just two. Now take the third derivative. Then it'd be zero. It'd be zero. And and every time you you further, it'd just be zero, zero, zero. So it's a continue on, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so th that's what we want to make sure. We want to make sure that each um, uh, term, each derivative can be found for every order. By the way, did you give this link out to everybody? Drag? Did anybody want? To, I, I'm not seeing who's coming in, so you're gonna have to like let me know. Um, but, uh, if anybody I'll, wants to join us and, and I'll start come inviting. On oh shit! Yeah, my bad. Let me. I see. I know you want to get to people, but uh, you know, maybe yeah. maybe G-Man wants to learn something. I don't know. Let me see. Yeah, just someone just sent me a message, so let me. Oh fuck! Is it? All right. Now, oh. I will give you fair warning. This looks a lot more complicated than it really is, although it is not simple. So it's one of those trade-off things. To, to try to be able to explain it conceptually to where people understand it. Because this is daunting. This is calc level two stuff. Now, to people like EO who teaches this stuff, he could probably do it in his sleep. But to most people, yeah, it's 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 a little bit intimidating. But I want to see if I can explain it in a way where it doesn't really confuse people. Okay. So, so Steve, are you going to wait? Yeah. Are you waiting or are you going to keep going? Are you going to wait for the other people to show up? I'm gonna I was just going to ask you, do you have paint? Or Sorry, go ahead then. No, no. You, if you want to, if you want to put this in paint and you know give visuals, I'm okay with that. No, I just I wanted to show everyone quickly. This entire uh, process of taking uh, Taylor series depends on something called the mean value theorem, which is a really cool graphical physical representation. But do you you don't have a touchscreen computer, right? No, no, and I'm not going to get into the mean value theorem. But you could, but uh, but uh, yeah, look at pick once a link. You know, I'm fine with that. I fucking hate mean value theorem. So if, if you want, if right, you, want link, actually, you, you have to mesh his drag knot. What's that? And one last thing, Steve. Sure. The, the one last thing. Um, the reason, the proof you're going to use today works because we have something called uniform convergence, which allows us to take term by term differentiation. In other words, derivatives are a linear operator, but it's not clear that if you have an infinite number of terms that you can take term by term. In other words, the sum of the derivatives, the derivative of the sums. But the mm -hmm. reason it works is because we have uniform convergence of the Taylor series, which you, is, by the way, um, I'm sorry. go ahead. I was just saying, do you think it's just us? A bookkeeping term. I just wanted to get out there. Yeah. Do you think that maybe? <coughs> excuse me. Normally we would normally we would explain to people summations and partial sums first. Uh, maybe we can do that. I, I can do that next time. I have no I have no problem with that. I, I they're not that hard. You would have to do like Cauchy sequences. I can't explain Cauchy sequences very well. But um, if if people want to understand how to find find the, the convergence of a sequence based upon the partial sums, the convergence of the, of the partial sums, we could do that. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, I think, than this, even though this looks a lot more complicated. But okay, so let's just dive into it. The Taylor expansion looks like this. Remember, yesterday we had I had asked specifically EO to give us a form of how to do like a binomial expansion, right? And he gave us the whole uh, combinatorial way that it should look using the exponents from Pascal's triangle and how the exponents should look and how each time, each term, the exponent is decreasing on one and increasing on the other. So A is A is starting up at A squared, and then it'll be A, and then it goes away, and then B will be like going up. So there's a form for these things, right? This is the form that we're looking for in the Taylor expansion. The compact form, it's called, is, by the way, you can see my mouse, right? Okay. I, I just saw the outside. So this is the compact part right here. This, like right here, is the compact. This is the expanded part of it. And hopefully by the time we get done, this is going to make sense to you. Um, to, who, is, is, is there anyone else in here besides you, Drag? Yeah, this should be um, uh, Andreas. Is that Andreas? Yeah. I, I just want to see if anybody else is in here that maybe has not have seen this before and ask them if it, if, how confusing it looks to them. Oh, I've seen it before. Actually. Actually. I've okay. actually seen it so, before. It's actually pretty useful stuff. Okay. So I'll ask the outside chat. If anybody looks at this and hope and that maybe it looks confusing to them, hopefully by the end of this it won't make it won't be that confusing. So <laughs> what we want to do is again for the assumption we want to evaluate um, as as x equals a. Now if you notice if we make that assumption x equals a, what happens to these terms? Uh, like, for example, in the expanded part, let's assign x 0, right? Or x to be a. 
what is a minus a? Zero, right? And zero times a constant is zero. Here's the same thing. A minus a is zero. Zero squared is zero times constant is zero. All these terms go away when I make the value of x equals a. So what am I left here in this in the expansion when all these other terms go away? What's what's the only thing that's left? Anybody? Oh, you're only left with an arbitrary constant. You're left with an arbitrary constant, which is going to be we're going to be assigning that the subscript of c zero. Okay, so this is the only constant that's not affected by this because x is not a a variable in this term. So in all these other terms, they go away. So I am left with just this. So I am trying to find each that does it, we can find a way to get each constant here because we know the value, uh, or we we know the value of, of x is equal to a. We, we, that'll go away, but we don't know what these constants are, so we have to see if we can actually find a constant for these terms to make this expansion work. So if I assign it this to be a, I'm only left with c sub zero. That is my first constant in this equation. Okay, so given the the zeroth derivative, um, I'm only left with this first term. Okay, this is where you're going to get a little bit more confusing, because now we want to take the higher derivatives. We want to take the the, the the first, second, third, fourth derivative. And it's a step-by-step -step process. And we're going to be using the power rule, which, again, if you guys remember, the power rule for the, for a simple function like this of, of an x with an exponent, you just subtract 1 from the exponent, you bring the exponent down to the coefficient, and then you have your, your derivative. So x squared, you subtract 1 from the exponent, giving you x to the first, which is x, and the 2 becomes a coefficient, 2x. Okay, so if you ever get confused there, just think of something simple like x squared. x cubed would work very similar. Take the, the exponent, bring it down to the coefficient, and subtract 1. So 3x squared would be 3x, excuse me, x cubed would be 3x squared, right? And then if you take the next derivative, 2 times 3 is 6, I end up with 6x because it's x to the first, and then you just have 6 and you have 0 again. So that's how this process goes. And I'm also going to be using Lagrange notation. Yesterday I used um, Leibniz notation because it's a lot easier for what I was doing yesterday. When you're doing Taylor series, it's a hell of a lot easier to use Lagrange. Would you agree, Yo? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to use Lagrange notation. Lagrange notation just looks like this. F, F of A here, where A is the argument to the function, that is just um, your, your zero derivative. That's your, your function. This little prime symbol means I'm taking the first derivative. Okay, so I've, if I have f prime of x, that's my first derivative of the function f of x. That's all that means. It's the same thing as saying d over dx, or if you have a variable y involved, dy over dx. That's all it means, first derivative. So let's take the first derivative <coughs> excuse me, of, of this initial form of the, of the, of the Taylor expansion. Okay? So when we take the derivative of a constant drag, what do we get? Shit, I don't know. I have my mic still on. Uh, you said the first derivative of the constant. Of the constant, it is one to be the same constant. No, it's zero. Remember? It is. Yeah, you take the derivative of constant. Zero. Well, think about it. Uh, you take the derivative of six x, you end up with with six, and then the derivative of six is zero. And if I may, Steve, think about it more. Constants don't change, therefore the derivative has to be zero. Yeah, there's, there's no time no to change to a constant. Oh, okay. That's that's kind of what I was I was thinking when I heard constant. I was like, well, yeah. it would be the same. Okay. So yeah, you take the derivative of that, and it. Okay, I, I got it. Yeah. I just gotta. I it's have a, a hard time remembering whether it's either or that kind of. Yeah, thing. Well, I know that you way. can't do much with it either way. Think about this way. He's exactly right because we're because all derivatives are a time rate of change with respect to something, right? Very, constants don't have a time rate of change. They're constant. So what's the time rate of change of six? Of zero. What's the time rate of time rate of change? Ten. Zero. So, all constants have a, a time rate of change of zero. So, and here's here's yet another way: constants are horizontal lines. And what's the slope of any horizontal line? We could ask anybody. Zero. Okay, that's zero. how I can remember it. There that's we go. Okay. Thing. There we go. Right. For people that maybe remember the other day, we were talking about derivatives. We we're actually taking um, a derivative of a slope at a certain point. Right. And and if you have a line, we can take the the slope of that line, and that gives us a derivative. So, so this, so we, is we take the derivative of the first constant here, that goes to zero, right? Yeah. Okay. So, we, so I don't. I'm not going to put this in this equation because it's zero. 
Right? I could write zero plus, but there's no reason to. Now let's look at the second term. Okay. <laughs> this is you gotta remember there's an implicit one right here. Okay, so this this quantity, uh, this uh, parenthetical group x minus a, there's a one exponent here. And anything to the first exponent is itself, correct? So we right. just don't show that. It's just convention. Could you? Sure, you want to be wrong, but it's just convention you don't need to show to the first, just like you don't need to show a coefficient of one. Every every number, every value, excuse me, exponent has a coefficient of one if it's just x, right? What's the coefficient of x? One. Why bother showing it, right? So right. here I have one. So I'm going to take, what is one minus one? It's zero, right? So zero, what is these, if I raise something to the zeroth power, do you remember what it, what, what it so is? One, I believe. It's one. Yeah. Very good. So this bit, whole term becomes one. Okay, you can even know the zero in here, right? Because a, it's, x is equal to a, so a minus a is zero. So a is zero raised to the zero power is one. Yeah, I know a lot of people can confused about that. Don't worry, it's just you have to accept it. <laughs> okay, you just have to accept reality. It's that's the way it is. Um, so what is what is a constant times one? It's a constant, right? All right. Um, Oh, I, I'm sorry, but I I, I forgot. I got I got to move the I got to move the uh, the exponent down. So I, I actually got ahead of myself. So the the first term goes away. This this right here becomes c1, which is right here, right? This next term, I bring this coefficient down, so it's two c sec c2, and then I subtract one, leaving one. So I'm left with two c sub two x minus a, which is right here. My next term, bring the three down, three c sub three x minus a. 3 is minus, minus 1 is 2, and I left this term, and so on. So this right here, this express, this whole um, um, equation, by the way, the difference between an equation and an expression, if anybody cares, uh, is the equal sign. <laughs> so an uh, equation has an equal sign, an expression doesn't. Uh, if I just say um, 5x, that's an, ex that's an e e uh, expression, not an equation. But this, this right here is the first derivative of this, and since... Um, and since, again, we're sticking in x equals a, if a minus a equals 0, this term goes away, this term goes away, and this term goes away. So what am I left with here? Is that f prime of a equals c to the sub 1? Yep, exactly. So I've, I've now I've gotten two constants so far. I've got the first constant here I know exists. I know <laughs> i got the second constant here. We're going to keep on going and do the second derivative of that. Now, the second derivative we can just get from, from the derivating the first derivative, right? We don't have to go back to the original and do like the third derivative kind of thing. Um, oh, midnight! Uh, can you get midnight in here? He wants to come in, please. I, I thought I sent it to you. I'm sorry. I got him. Okay, so the second derivative. We're gonna do the same thing. So here, the constant c sub one gets derivated. It goes away because it's zero. So I'm not gonna put it in here. Here I have the exponent one that get, that got brought down here. Two times one is just two. So I have two c two. Because again, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this is, becomes one. This right here, two comes down here, so I have three times two, c sub three. This exponent gets diminished by one, which is one. This leaving this quantity and so on. Now I'm actually leaving this way for a reason. I'm not showing six Hello. c sub three for a reason. Hey, midnight. So the, this like qu this term here, I'll bring the coefficient down. I'll end up with four times three. C sub four, uh, parenthetical group x minus a raised to the second power because it's three minus one. Now there's, like I said, there's a very specific reason why I'm keeping it this way and not putting this as twelve and not putting this as six. And I'll show you. You'll show. I'll show you why. It's going to make sense as as we keep going. And by the way, I have to give you guys a warning. This is going to be a long hangout. So if you don't like math, you're going to be <laughs> bored. But if you do like it or <laughs> wants to learn, this is interesting. I'm actually enjoying this. So please try to bear with me. And I. I, and I I haven't made it too many faux pas because EO isn't like messages in me going, damn it, Steve, what the hell are you talking about? Um, so I no, only took so Algebra see. 1 and I can semi understand. Well, so that's, Steve, you're doing that's fine. What, the, what? The only thing I'd add is uh, in almost every power series, we center it at zero to make our lives easier. The only one we don't is the logarithm series because logarithm is not defined at zero. You're doing fine. What I'm saying is you could probably make your life easier if you just go ahead and make a zero. I'm going, to explain, I'm going to get into explaining a McLaren series. I'm doing the Taylor first, and then I'm going to explain to get to McLaren, and then why it's easier. I am starting ground up, buddy. But you're right. But I know. I Normally, normally, <laughs> normally when we're, since we're doing um, x equals zero, 
um, we're, we're doing it around, around a zero, we could use a different type of series called a McLaren series. Um, but I wanted to show people the Taylor series first, how we get to a Taylor to McLaren, and then use a McLaren series to actually get to the derivation of e to the x. So there's a method to my madness. Get your energy drinks, folks. Yeah, you guys are going to be a long hangout, brother. Okay, so so this is my if, if the first derivative was f prime, the second derivative is f double prime. Okay? So since all these other terms go away, because again, x equals a, a minus a is zero, this whole term here goes to zero, this whole term goes to zero. And I, I kind of wish in this particular program I could put a little arrow here. In, in nuke school, what we would do is we write an arrow through this. Right, and then just put zero up here, and there's no way to do this in this particular program. But normally, when you, I don't know how EO teaches it, and again, this we wasn't did. a college we, thing. But we, did. What, we 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 say it vanishes. It's really cool. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You so what you normally do is you just put a you put a big old arrow through this, usually like a red arrow or whatever. You just put an arrow through it, and then you put zero up here, and this means this whole term goes to zero. It just goes away. Boom. Or you just have you just cross it out. So I wish I could kind of do that because it's a visually appealing way of looking at it. This goes away. This goes away. But I'm left with this. So the second derivative is just equal to two c sub two. Okay. So now I've got three constants. I've c sub zero, c sub one, two c sub two. Um, excuse me. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember how I got the. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, let's see. Through two. Uh, how do I get the uh, the half here? I'm trying to. I'm going back. Oh oh yeah. Um, you solve for c one. You divide both sides by two. Yeah, I solve. That's right. Okay. Yeah. I'm. I'm you know. Uh, so what basically I did was I divided each side by two here. Okay. So I'm ending up at c two. On this side, and I'm taking two, and I'm just moving it over to this side. And by doing that, I'm just dividing this side by two. These cancel out. Again, I wish I wish this program allowed you to do it, because normally what you would do is you put a what's called a, a vaniculum uh, or a horizontal bar. There's a slight difference, but a, a vaniculum, this is right here, is called a vaniculum or horizontal bar. But you put that there, and you put two underneath, and these, these cancel out, two over two. And then I'm left just with this constant, so I end up with uh, two, F double prime, of, of a over two. So I know my constant now. Now, moving on to the next one, we're at the third derivative now. The third derivative would be the derivative of 2c2, which is zero again. The derivative of this part of the term, which is going to give us three squared, uh, excuse me, three times 2c sub three. This term is going to give us this, and so on. I think by now you kind of you can see the pattern forming. So I'm just going to divide both sides by three by two uh, by three and by uh, you two. Said the, but you said the derivative of uh, c or excuse me two c sub two is zero. Well, here, here the derivative of this is zero, right? Two c sub two is zero, right? It's a constant. Oh, right? okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, the derivative times of this is constant. here's one here, right? Yeah, right. So uh, this is this is one. So I'm just yeah. I'm just ending up with one times three times two times c sub three. This gives us oh, this term okay. here. Yeah, I, term, I forgot that that c was representing a constant, not a, a actual uh, a variable. Yeah, I, right. Yeah, these right, c's are constant. Around. That's a, you know. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, don't get confused because c is not a variable in these these types of uh, math. C is a constant here, represents a constant. So don't 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 think because it's a letter it has to be a variable. There's a, there's a mistake. A lot of people make in algebra. They see they see a letter that represents a a number. And they think it's a variable. And I had a, a that same guy that that complain that is there's an engineer that can, tries to convince people that one equals 0.99 repeating isn't true. He actually was trying to convince people that um, that these constants, because they are a letter, are called variables. They're not. And I right, even so argue with EO on that. They're not. No, I mean the whole point. We use the last few letters of the alphabet to represent variables, and we use the first few letters to represent constants. That's a brilliant in order point. To, yes, in order to avoid this confusion. And that and is exactly what I explained to him. If you have A, B, or C, you're generally using them as fixed constants, and X, Y, Z higher in the alphabet, you're using those as variables. I, I, I explained to him the exact same thing. So thank you. I'm glad that you pointed that out. Now they may not always hold, though. That's that's a rule of thumb. Right, so let's not because again with the binomial expansion a plus b, right there we're using it as variable. So, sure, okay. and, and look, the context is everything. And I remember a joke I heard in grad school. This this guy was teaching a stats class, and he was using x's everywhere. What you doing? He goes, this is the problem when you name all your kids x. 
<laughs> this is a constant. I don't think I get it. I'm trying to figure it out. We we overuse letters in math. Like for example, oh oh, I get find it. the okay, okay, okay. This is the problem when you name all your kids X. Never mind. Mm. Bad math joke. I've got a million of them, folks. Yeah, the, my math joke was funnier with the whole derivative thing. Insanity. Okay. Oh, by the way, did I tell people in this hangout how this all started? My joke. I don't think we I all understand. I think you told them last time. Nine, Steve. Yeah. So in this, but my joke was that got this all started was what's the definition of insanity? Taking the derivative of e to the x over and over again, and expecting different results. Now, to a math guy, that's funny. That's funny. So, all right. So, so, anyways, uh, <laughs> now that we end up with the third derivative, which of course is f three prime, right? We have three primes here. If I put x equals a again, what happens to this? This goes to zero. Zero times all this is a constant of zero, right? Here, it's not affected, so I end up with three times two times a constant, which is this. I subtract both sides by three and two. I end up with my constant with f uh, third derivative uh, of a over three over two. And again, there's a reason why I'm leaving this three as a two. I know people can say, well, why aren't you reducing? Why aren't you putting you know six there? There's a reason you'll, you'll see. And by the way, you're also going to notice that I don't use multiplication signs. This is called implicit multiplication by juxtaposition. Or if you just want to say implicit multiplication, that's fine. But all this means three times two. This is this is literally the same as a multiplication sign, but the multiplication sign is not shown. They are defined exactly the same way in mathematics. Um, when you learn about rings and whatever, you're going to find that the way they define certain things, binary operators or partially binary operators, binary operators like the derivatives, uh, excuse me, the uh, the uh, division symbol, they're defined a very specific way in maths, and the multiplication symbol. It doesn't matter whether you show it or not. Multiplication is multiplication. So you might have seen these Facebook problems out there, like 6 divided by 2, parentheses, 1 plus 2 equals something. And people say, well, it's 1. Well, I had begged to differ. It is actually 9 using standard order operations because implicit multiplication has the same priority as explicit. But that's a different that's a different hangout altogether. Uh, Frank wants to join. Okay. We got it. Okay. So um, the fourth derivative, does anybody walk? We're going to let somebody else walk this through it because this is the, 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 the furthest I got or the, I, I don't need to go much further to make my point on the, but somebody wants to do the fourth derivative. So let's take the next derivative of three to the, the uh, three prime. So somebody want to do this? Who do we got here? Anybody? My, my son doesn't shut up. All right. So uh, where are we at? The the third you're going to take the derivative of each term here. So take the derivative of this term. Uh, so that's a six times uh, c sub three. So that's that's going to be zero. Okay. Uh, so we don't bother to show it down here. It's gone. Take the derivative okay. of this one. All right. So is that what four times three times two times uh, c sub four? Mm -hmm. so, times one, which we don't show. We have this one. term. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> and then and then I I this actually I made a mistake right here. I just noticed. <laughs> so I was what so where is yeah I was wondering where that came from. Did I make, no, wait. This is X one. Right. No, it, it's right. It's right. I just, I just, I, I, I capitalized this. That's, that's, yeah. Here we go. Wait, uh, so is that supposed to be the, the next set of, um? Yeah, this is not shown over here. This okay. is not shown. Right. See this plus dot dot dot. This means it continues on. I should have noted that. This means it continues on. This is the first term. This is the second term. There's a third term. There's a fourth term. There's a fifth term. We're adding up all the terms to infinity is what we're actually attempting to do. So the next term in here would be this, and I showed it because I wanted to show people oh, how you just drop the next down. term, but it's not in the, it's not shown here. It's implied up there, but you made it explicit down there. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So this all goes away because x equals a, a minus a is zero. So this all goes to zero anyways. So I'm left with this, divide each side by these, four, three, and two. I'm left with c sub four, fourth derivative of a, of a over four, three, and two. Now Here's the here's where we start getting really cool. Therefore, I can actually say this: for every derivative of a, it is going to be over the n factorial. And remember what a factorial was. A factorial was um, if I say one factorial, it's one. If I say two factorial, it's two times one. Three factorial is three times two times one. Four factorial is four times three times two times one. Five factorial is five times four times three times two times one. So. This is why I'm showing it this way. You remember I told you that there's an implied one in every denominator in a fraction, right? So this is actually the four times three times two times one. And what's another way of writing four times three times two times one? 
four factorial. Four factorial. That is why we can actually say with this equation here. For C sub n, it is going to be equal to the derivative over n factorial uh, with the argument of a. Once, once we recognize that, we can take this right here and we can plug it, chug it way back here into our original formula here. Okay? Because C sub n is now, is now equal to this. And if you go back to here, I, uh, I, I'll pl I'm plugging in right here. See what this, this constant is? All I'm doing is I'm taking this constant and I'm just showing it for what we know what its value is or we know what is another uh, way of expressing it is, is this. And I end up th with this. And this is basically my original equation, right, with this shown for C sub n. Does it make sense so far? Yeah. You guys with me? All right. So far, so good. Just right. you may want to clarify uh -huh. that zero factorial is one. Zero factorial is one. Yeah. Um, good point. Um, in order to make this work in a Taylor series, zero factorial has to equal to one. It is defined to be that way. Okay. So just again, it's one of those things. Accept it as as Jesus told you it. <laughs> it's because you're not you're not going to win an argument that it's zero. People have also. Tried. Uh, the multiplication thing you went over, I forget what it's called. That's just how you're taught now. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, I think my daughter actually is learning it that way too, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so now that we have this, this expressed this way, again, this formula, we can do the expansion. Because remember, this is the compact form, right? But we want, we want to know the expanded form as well. So the expanded form is going to look like this, okay? And all we're really saying with this is that, the, remember the, the, where I said that the, the, first, the zero derivative of a function is itself, which is this? And then th these, these right here are going to correspond to what we were, were showing like up here, right? Right for the second constant, that f prime, double prime a over 2, c is f of f prime of a. That's all we're doing is we're just putting in the constants here. And we're just, instead of taking from the constant, we're just putting in what we've already found these constants to be. That's why we wanted to find these constants. Uh, uh, f of a is equal to c sub 0. f prime of a is equal to c sub 1. f double prime of a over 2 uh, factorial is equal to c sub 3, etc. Okay? So all we're really doing is we're building upon stuff we've already gone over. That's how most of math is. We're just building upon, building upon things. And so... If you lose a step somewhere, it can get very confusing really quickly because you don't know where to go back to, right? So this is what we actually end up. This is actually the, the actual formula for a Taylor expansion or a Taylor formula. Now, what Eo was saying, we can make a Taylor series into what's called a McLaurin series, and it's a lot easier to work with. And what we're doing is we're evaluating it at zero. So what we're saying is if A equals zero, and x equals a, which was our, one of our initial substance, then obviously, right, what happens if these two are equal? What is x actually equal because of the uh, uh, transitive property, right? x equals 0, correct? And then we're going to call that a special kind of Taylor series called a McLaurin series. All McLaurin series are Taylor series, but not all Taylor series are McLaurin. Now that we're evaluating at x equals 0, we end up with this. All we're doing is we're taking what we already know here, and we're putting in 0 for a. That's it, okay? That's all we're doing. Now, as we put, we put 0 in there, we end up with the, this as the expansion, which is the same thing as this, right? But instead of having a, we have 0 in here, right? And we end up with a new uh, compact formula, which is this. And the reason for this is, is because if you notice, by setting x to 0 and making a equal to x or x equals to a, this part of the term goes away. Okay, I'm only left now with something like this. I'm only left with x to the n. Um, Sorry, Steve. The, You're, you just mean a equals 0 because the a point is zero. we're going to approximate. Yeah. This is going to work for every single x. For every real yeah, x, right. this will work. So right. you just mean a equals 0. Yeah, you're right. So, so look at if a equals zero, right? This equals zero. I end up with x minus zero, which is zero, right? So I just left with x to the end. That's where I'm getting this from. So this goes away. This part of the right here. This, yeah, I shouldn't have said the whole thing goes away. This, this a goes away because it goes to zero, um, and I just left with x to the end, which is right here. And this is called the McLaurin 
series right here. This is what we're going to be using now. Now this is how we're going to evaluate in order to see the Taylor series for e to the x. Now again, this is where it gets circular because you cannot use this in a proof to show that the derivation or the derivative of e to the x is e to the x because I have to I have to use the derivative of e to the x in order to find the Taylor series for e to the x. Okay, so I want very much to be clarified here. This is circular. Now, if we evaluate at x sub zero of uh, x sub zero zero, I have this formula, which is the exact same thing as here. The the expansion, which is the exact same thing here. And the way I like to do it is this. Um, I, I've done I've done it a couple of ways. I've, I found that 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 this way right here, the second way I'll show you is the way I prefer. But you can do it either way. But what is going to happen is we are going to take the zeroth derivative. The first, the second, and third, and keep going um, with any starting at zero, then one, then two, and find the derivative of each one and what it evaluates for at zero. Sounds a lot more complicated than it is. It really isn't. But I do want to. I do want to note something real quick before I go on. Um, <clears throat> uh, when you have something like this, f. Uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, F, 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 any one of these? What? What? I'm sorry. What? Oh no! I was just gonna ask something. I, 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 I've noticed that you have f of x, f prime of x, f prime two, f prime. Mm -hmm. two. Okay, you know, once you reach to a certain point, do you just put a number? That, you know, because uh, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, yeah, exactly. We're, we're actually gonna show a compact way to write this stuff. And so, so, sorry, Steve. You mean you have to have the parentheses, otherwise you mean composing the function four times. Sorry, it's nitpicking, but there's actually a profound difference between f to the fourth and f parentheses to the fourth. Yeah. Third. Yeah. Oh yeah, and I want, this is one of the I want to clarify. People may be looking at this, going, "Well, wait a minute. If this is zero times this, shouldn't this whole term be zero? No, don't 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 get confused with this and think that this is saying f double prime is times zero. That's not. This is the argument to this function. So it's f double prime of zero. Okay, that's where the, that's where the kind of the math stuff has to come in. You're not saying f prime times zero here, even though like right here, you're saying. Four times three times two. This is implicit multiplication with parentheses. This is not. This is a function with the argument being put into that function. Okay. That confuses a lot of people in mathematics. So, so says, sorry, uh, Steve. At the, at the bottom of your table where you have f prime, f double prime, f triple prime. Yeah. Um, you, you need an f super left parenthesis for right parenthesis. And it's actually really important because if you don't have the parentheses, that means the function composed with itself, which is something completely different. Just oh, wait, you're right, you're right, you're right. So and you're, by the way, you're just, let you're me tell the people, this. there's a reason Maclaurin series is so useful. Um, let's just ask the people, what's zero times any number? Drag, what's zero times any number? Zero. 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 Right, and so what happens is in a lot of these derivations for sine and cosine, if you center it around zero, it makes the, calc the computations much easier. But we should note, this proof will work for any val real value of a. That's what's so cool about it. But yes. making it a McLaurin series makes it a lot easier for the computation. And and also I'll note on that. Um, I was going to get into this, but um, it's also cool that the McLaurin series for any polynomial is the same series only backwards. You'll get you'll basically end up you you always end up what you start with. Only you just you start you'll, you'll see it, it was working backwards. But for example, if I say what's the McLaurin series of x to the n plus three, it's three plus x to the n. You can do it in your head. You don't need to go through all this. That's pretty cool. It's a neat little trick. But anyways, so uh, is this, this is what you want me to fix right here, right? Yeah, and I'm sorry. It, it just yeah. it's not even me being pedantic. It's literally no, like, no, no, yeah. no. It's, right? No, of course. Yeah, it has. It should be that. Okay. So let me explain what this table actually is denoting here. The zero derivative of the function is the function. We already established that, correct? So this is going to be the function that we get for the zeroth derivative. So what's the zeroth derivative of e to the x? Anybody? It should be 1. No, no. The zeroth derivative zero. of any function is the function. The zero derivative. Hold on. If e to the x is the function and the zeroth derivative of any function is the function, what should we get? E to oh, I'm, I'm e thinking of raising it to the power. I'm sorry. That's us. What, no, I got that. that. Yeah. No, it's just e to the x, right? Because we're literally getting the same thing we put in. If you say, what's the, the zeroth derivative of x squared? It's x squared. Holy it's shit, I got that right. Yep, you're spot on. So my zeroth derivative, remember, this is a zero up here, if you think about it, okay? So my zeroth derivative is the function, okay? Now, when n equals zero, okay, 
What is e to the zeroth power? One. One. We're evaluating this because remember, we're, we're going to be doing a summation here. Remember, n equals zero to infinity. That's by the way, what the symbol means. We're going to be taking summation. When I'm evaluating this, I'm evaluating it at zero. So e to the zeroth is equal to one. Okay. So no matter if if, if n is if, if n is um, uh, the first, so the, the zeroth derivative, right? If this is zero, f zero, zeroth derivative of zero is is one. So the second derivative we're going to take, right, with n equals one. What is the second derivative of e to the x? Oh, Steve, I see the confusion. You need superscripts there, buddy. Sorry, another formatting issue there. I think where, that may be why they're confused. You may say f to the the nth derivative of f of x, right? That's what you mean there. That's why it's confusing. See how it looks all on the same level? It's just, it's, are, you, are you just because of the formatting, as you're saying? Yeah, I think yeah. I wonder if that's why they're confused. Yeah, it's Because what, it like, like, what it looks like you're saying, you're saying, it looks like you're saying f of n times x. Yeah, no, I'm not. Yeah, and I'm not trying to do that. What I'm saying, yeah, this is not f of n times x here, or not f of n times zero. What it actually is is n here is the the derivative number. Okay, so f zero would be f, f for zero's derivative, right? And then we're substituting that into x. So if this is the zero's derivative, we're just putting zero here. Is it, are you guys following? Actually, excuse me, no. I'm actually, I'm, 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 actually, I'm sorry. I, I, I wouldn't be correct. That. The, the X is actually always going to be zero because we're evaluating it at zero. Okay. So, so this is continuing. Maybe I'll make more sense. What is the, what is, the, if the first, if the zero derivative of e to the X is, is e to the X, if I take another derivative of it, won't I get the same thing back, e to the X again? Which again, we're trying to prove that, which is again, this is why it's circular. But, this is one of the things when you know it for a Taylor series, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The second derivative is e to the x. All the derivatives I'm going to get are going to be e to the x. Okay? So for any natural number between now and infinity, whatever derivative number I want, by the way, would you put this, should I put this n in, in parentheses or is it fine that way? Yo. No, the n, the n has to be in parentheses. And you, what okay. you really want to say is for every n. You can't, n equals infinity is nonsensical, but sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah for every n. Uh, well, this is bad form, but I'll, I'll, I will, I'll get further into that. But yeah, you don't ever say x equals uh, n equals infinity, but let that one slide. We'll call yeah, that sure. a, uh, we'll call as that an a, um, as an upper index, sure. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, um, well, they, no, they call it a, um, uh, there's a special, there's a special thing for that. Um, um, oh, come on, help me out. Yeah, you know, what is it when you have it like a, you, you're kind of, you're not, you're not sloppy in your nomenclature, but you're just, um, hand waving? No, it's not that. This is actually a mathematical term for it. Um, uh, this is bugs me when I can't think of something. Here, let me let me just say something in support of Steve right now. This is yeah, let, me think of that. let me think. Of, let me think what it is. What you're talking. So everyone who's listening, um, Steve is very brave to do this because this is third. This is Calc three, not Calc one, not Calc two, Calc three, and he's doing it from memory, and it's it's pretty impressive. So again, just him taking the the risk and doing this as a public service. Three? I thought it was yeah. Calc three. No, oh, okay. I didn't Calc three. Yeah, um, I can't think of there's a term. There's a term that you mathematicians use when you basically are a little bit sloppy in your nomenclature, but most mathematicians don't understand it. So right, but you're a little the point loose. Is you, you you meant the nth term anyway, though. You, you yeah, meant I the, did. The, yeah. Okay. So the point is, that the, the, maybe, I'm, let me go to the next. Let me go to the right here because this is, actually shows a little bit easier. This is why I don't like a table like this. This is another way to do it. I like this way to do it. What I'm saying, all I'm saying here is that the Zero, a to the sub zero, right, which is my zero's derivative of e raised to zero, because I'm, I'm evaluating it at zero, is one. For the first derivative of a sub one is the first derivative of e to the zero is equal to one, right? Then here, a sub, a sub two is equal to this term. Um, and again, if you look here, if you go back way back here, all I'm doing is I'm doing the same thing I've already discovered here. Here's my first thing. Here's my, my, my C sub 2 is equal to this, right? F double prime um, uh, of A over 2. My C3 is equal to this. That's all I'm doing is I'm, I'm using that in a, in a table type form, okay? So I'm just saying here's C1, here's C2, here's C3, here's C4, okay? So when you actually evaluate this as, as 0, E to the 0 over 2 is 1 over 2. Oh, excuse me, two, two factorial. Here, 
again, the constant is what I've found earlier is equal to e raised to the zero because I'm evaluating it as zero, which is equal to one over three factorial. So basically, if you notice kind of a pattern here, I have one, one, one over two factorial, one over three factorial. If I took the next one, if, I'm not going to show it to you yet, but if I took the next one, a sub four, what do you think the, the next result should be? If you, if you follow the pattern. One over uh, four factorial. <laughs> Excuse me, yeah, one over four factorial. So for every, every, um, <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me, for every every a sub three, a sub four, that's all that's going to go down here. So a sub five is going to be one over five factorial. Now, if you want to write that in compact form, this is what you basically get. For all of n, it's going to be equal to one over n factorial. And we can express it this way. n, a sub n is of, of for every uh, n, evaluated at zero is equal to one. Now, I've written this two different ways, and maybe maybe EO can correct me. I, I was going to ask him on this. One way to write it is this, for all yes, of right. them. Now, I wanted, to show so, I wanted to show somebody a different way to write this. Did I get it right? Because I guessed. No, it's, it's beautiful. The, the only thing yeah. is, and this is, again, called a um, universal quantifier. Existential as universal to, quantifier. As, yeah, as opposed to existential qualifier. The only thing, again, uh, and I hope that everyone can understand, what Steve means by F of N of a zero, he means F super N of zero. Yeah. Um, this, yeah the, formatting, you know, yeah. Yeah. I've, well, it is, I mean... I, I should be raising these, shouldn't I? Would that be easier? It's good. No, look, Steve, uh, you're, it's, it's formatting. amazing that you're even doing this, and it's it's great that you were able to do it in such short notice. I hate, <laughs> I hate to nitpick. No, no, it's right. No, you're right. I mean, it's a formatting error, uh, issue, but but um, it's basically saying for the the, the, the f, f of n, excuse me, not f of n, f raised to, to whatever power to give you the derivative. So f raised to the zero power here, f, f raised zero is going to be the zeroth derivative. When I'm evaluating zero, so I'm basically saying for all values of any derivative I have, with zero being what I'm putting into that value, I'm going to get one, and that's what's happened here. I got one, 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 one. My 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 uh, numerator here is always going to be one every time. So the other way of writing with this little upside down a, uh, people may may see this in mathematics. It means for all of, right? The other thing they might see is a whole bunch of the terms. One of the other ones they might see is a backwards E. That means there exists. So if you see like upside down N, backwards E, uh, Y, that just means for like all of N, there exists Y. Um, and this it doesn't set building notation that you'll see in, in higher maps. But this is another way to write it that looks cool. Um, it, it, it's one of those things that looks complicated, but it's not. So this is why I'm trying to demystify math. It's just saying, it's saying uh, one for all of N. That's it. For any value of n, 0 to infinity, you get 1. Okay. So now I got this nice compact form right here. Um, for any value of n, I'm going to end up with 1 divided by n factorial times x to the n. And I end up, <coughs> when I expand that out, right? And let's expand this out real quick because this is the most important formula here. <coughs> Drag, this part of the equation right here is the compact form. Okay, right here. Let's start off with the summation here. n equals 0. What is x to the n if I put in if I put in zero here? X to the n is anything raised to the zero powers? It's, it's, it's gonna be one. One? And what and, and if I put zero here, zero factorial is zero factorial. I think what is that? That's not zero, it's one, isn't it? Yep, and so what's one over one? It's gonna be one. Here's my first term. Let's go to the next one. N equals one. Okay, so x equals one equals equal to or excuse me, x raised to the first power is equal to Oh, my son's talking. Is it, uh, in, is it oh my one factorial? X, X, X raised to the first power. X raised to the first power. It's going to be one. Think about that. No, Drake, like X to the first power. So oh, whatever X. X is, it's X. Good. X. Oh, yes, yeah, X. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. It's X. Right. So what, and, and X over one factorial is X over one. So I just left with X. Now, what you're not seeing here, now I could very well make this a little bit clearer but you won't ever see it written like this because it's not <clears throat> it's not that you do it but i can easily put one over uh, excuse me one over zero factorial x equals over one factorial two squared over two factorial if i wanted to let me see if i can actually uh, i'll actually do it for you maybe it will kind of uh, show you um let me get to where it is on here so uh one over here we go so if i say one over one 
Okay, if I say x over 1, actually, you know what? Let me do it this way. So maybe it shows even better. Actually, 0 factorial. If I may, Drag, it's the same reason in organic chemistry, the vertices on aromatic rings simply mean carbon, and everybody knows that. In the same way, the implied coefficient is 1. Yeah. So this is actually what it's looking like, okay? Right? Because I have n down here, right? So I have, uh, you know what? Let me. Let me get this right. Da, da, da. There we go. That's better. That's not the right bracket. One second. I'll fix it. Oh, did I just totally screw that up? Uh, one sec. Technical problems. One sec. Let me get this back to where it was. Right. I'm doing <laughs> here we go so this 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 fact this should actually be down here so I'm trying to get this to to look right so this is actually the formatting thing than anything else so make sure I got this right there we go now now we're cooking here so uh, so Steve make sure they understand those exclamation points mean that the numbers are very angry <clears throat> Yeah, um, this this is what this no is one, actually what a, this nothing. Is, well, they're not. Yeah, hang on. Well, they're not. They're not varying. They don't even vary as n here. But the, what what this is is because I, I stick in zero in here, right? The first term is zero factorial, which is equal to one. The second one is n equals one. One factorial is one. So I don't have to show these, right? That's why you leave them out. But if you actually look at it, it's zero factorial, one factorial, two factorial, three factorial, four factorial. The next one would be fifth. And if you notice. It's the same factorial as it is the exponent, right? Because I have the exponent up here. So let, let's continue on. Um, if n equals 2, right? Then I have with x squared over 2 factorial right here. And then x cubed over 3 factorial. Do you see the pattern? Everybody? Yeah, maybe. Let me delete this because uh, I'm not used to seeing it that way. So. Son's talking in my ear, sorry. <clears throat> All right, so this is, what the, this is what the Taylor expansion should actually look like. Now we can get into the, the, the actually doing a proof of why the derivative e to the x is e to the x. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to start with let let, and again this is not rigorous, it's not formal, um, it, it won't fly, but it, it's, it's for it's just for explanatory purposes. So if I let the function e to the x be f of x equals e to the x, my formula for the Taylor expansion, right, which is actually the McLaren in this case. Um, was e to the, for the e to the x is this, okay? Because we've already established it right here. Would you agree that this is what we're going to be using, and this is the expansion for it, which we've already discovered? So you got you guys with me? This is already we've already ex, we've already determined this to be the the Taylor series. We've already determined this to be the expansion for e to the x. Now we just did, all we do is very simple. We want to we want to evaluate it, which is the same thing I have written here, and I want to derivate. I want to take a derivative on both sides. So now I want to go back to the old nomenclature, the old nom uh, 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 way I like doing it, the d over dx. This is the the um, Leibniz notation, because I find for this type of format, it's a lot easier to use. It actually shows easier, too. So if I take d over dx with respect to e of, excuse me, um, of, e, of, of e of x, and I do it on this side. I've got to do it on this side as well. Anytime you, you take a derivative on one side, you can take a derivative on the other side. So on this particular side, I'm left with the derivative of e to the x. Now on this particular side, when I take the derivative of this right here, what happens? What's the derivative of 1? Anybody? The derivative of a constant is? Yeah. Said so the derivative of 1 or derivative of the constant? <laughs> well, the derivative of 1, which is oh, the derivative of a constant. Is, is going to be 0. Okay, that's my first term right here. What's the derivative of the next one, x? This one's a little bit harder, but do you remember the derivative of x? Think about it using the, the power or whatever. What, what, what would you think the next derivative would be if I had to say what's the derivative of x? If you just said x, uh, yeah. if it's just a variable. Mm. Well, think about this. One. What's, well, hang on. What's the, what's, the, uh, what's the implied coefficient of a variable that doesn't, ha doesn't show one? What's the implied one. coefficient? One. So I actually have one x. Now I'll take the derivative of one x, and what do you get? One. There you go. Oh no, no, no. Wait. If if it's just a variable, yeah, if it's yeah, just right, x, right. then it would be one. Yeah, right. yeah. So yeah. I move to exactly. one, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So my second term right here is one, right? 
So my first term goes, this one goes to zero. This one goes to one. My next one is going to be a little more complicated here, but see if you can figure it out. What's the derivative of x squared over 2x and why? What, what, what if, I may, if, if I yeah. may, Steve, it'll be easier to ask them to find the derivative of x squared and then uh, multiply by the constant. Well, afterwards. let's do it. Okay, what's the derivative of x squared? 2x, right? Would you guys agree? Yes. Remember, that's the one thing we love asking. What's the derivative of x squared? Anybody who's ever watched any of our videos might know, should know it's 2x. So if it's 2x, right, and I, so I have a coefficient of 2x, what happens here? What is 2 divided by 2 factorial? It just, it just gives you it just gives you the x. I see, I see what you're doing. It just, give, it, <clears throat> it just gives you the x, right? They cancel out. 2 divided yeah. by 2 factorial is 1, right? So I just left with x. Okay, see, so uh... <clears throat> Sorry, so he, see, uh, you know, the one is turned into a zero. The x of one, uh, you know, the the x squared, uh, yeah, you know, the x squared over the factorial of two of you know of two. Since that's one times two, uh, the x, you know, the the two comes over. Yeah, okay, I see. I see what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, same thing we've been doing, right? For the next term, three comes down here, right? And this will become an exponent of two. So I end up with three over three uh, factorial, which is yeah. actually <clears throat> simplify it is going to give you x squared over two. Factorial, by the way, these factorials are screwed up. I just noticed that. Um, let me uh, let me uh, bracket these so they're actually makes a little more sense there. I think you know. I think I I think I think these two videos need need, need to be sent to Edgar. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? All right, there you go. That makes more sense now. Um, since since this is where we're ending up with so far, I can get rid of this zero. Would you agree? Hmm. Yeah, I right? suppose it doesn't need to be there. Zero. Okay, so I am I'm ending up with d over dx of e of x equals this, right? Well, does this look familiar? This is kind of what we wanted to evaluate the, or take the derivative of the first place, right? Yeah. So, so the derivative of this whole thing gives us that whole thing again. Pretty right? much. So therefore, the derivative of e to the x, and we've established e to the x is equal to this, right? Because right here, e to the x is equal to this. The derivative of of e to the x is e to the x. Q -E Everybody clap. Everybody clap. Woo! Circular reasoning. It's invalid. Tell me, Circular reasoning. Can anybody tell me what QED stands for? Quadratic demonstrandum, which Correct. that which that, was to be shown. That was that that is what that 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 yeah stands for that to be which was shown. So, anyways, this is not a rigorous proof. I, again, I want to, I point that out, but it explains to people why the derivative of e to the x e to the x and. I didn't realize this was like this high of math. Uh, to me, it, again, I, I don't think it's that complicated. But for people that never had it, I can understand people going, "Oh my God, math!" But there's a there's a there's a there's a reason why this stuff works, right? There's a there's a method to the madness, and I, that's I don't want people to be scared of it because my math. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, and you guys are gonna you're gonna really think I'm 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 uh, being deprecating deprecating, but I'm not. My math skills suck. I am not good at that. Oh, stop, stop, Steve. You're lying. No, I, 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 dude, I, <laughs> I, I, I've had a habit, and I did a decent in it, but I am not a, 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 a you know, a, a math person. I mean, it's, it's not, but I, I, I grasp the concepts. And all I wanted to do here was explain to people um, the concepts. And one more thing before I, 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 I stop screen sharing, let me show you exactly what we were doing here. My addendum. This is the value of e, of pi, or it's not pi, e, right? 2.718281828, and it goes off infinity. Well, um, it goes off expanded notation, which is called an infinite decimal expansion. It's not. This is not an infinite number. Um, the reason it's not an infinite number is because it exists between two finite numbers, right? I can say it exists between one and three. I can say, say it exists between 2.5 and 2.8, right? <clears throat> so it has to be a finite number. So what we're doing is we're making approximations. So by using this, this uh, um, expanded notation that we had what we really get is when we when we actually do the math we stick in you know values for this stuff right remember i told you that each one of these things evaluates to one this goes way back to right here whenever i put in something it's always going to give you one right well this is what we get this is where the magic actually comes to play one plus one plus one half that's what this evaluates to plus one six plus 124 <coughs> gives you this and when i add another term one over 120, you know, like 120, it gives you this. And if I keep going, it gives you closer and closer to, to the value of E. And if I just did an infinite, an infinite amount of times, what do I get? 
I get the value of E. So what we're doing is we're just adding terms over and over again, summing them up to infinity to get the constant E. And pi works a very Steve. similar way. So, Steve, if you, if, you, if you notice, the first three numbers are always 2, 7, and 1. Unless, wait, never mind. Yeah, but that's, that's two, well, it's, it's 2, 7, but that's only because I'm, I'm adding these terms, right? If, yeah. I didn't, if I didn't get, if I just started with the first term, I'm approximating at 1, right? And if, the second, if I add the second term I'm approximating, I get 2. The third term, because it's 0.5, I'm at 2.5 with these three, right? If I have the next term, the next term. Now, if you guys remember back to the beginning, what is this actually representing? What is actually each of these terms representing? That goes back to, let me minimize this. Uh, see, that, that, that goes back to where we started again. This is my function, right? My very um, uh, first, first derivative kind of, is one plus, one, sec, 1 plus x, right, which is just, you know, here 1. It gives me a line. Again, I'm 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 at this point here, right? Tangent line. I'm at one. So if I were trying to approximate an infinite, you know, an infinite summation to get to two point seven, um, eight one five, whatever it is, I have to start somewhere. I'm starting with one. So I'm I'm getting there, but I'm not quite there yet, right? I'm I'm not anywhere near two point seven. So I take another one. I take the second derivative. Okay. Well, now I'm now I'm getting closer to this, right? I'm getting more and more approximation. I'm getting a lot closer every time I add another term. And every time I another, get an, add another term, I'm getting closer and closer. So if I added an infinite amount of terms in the series, then I, what do you think I should actually get? I should get the original function, yeah. correct? Yeah. There you go. That, that, there you go. That's, that, that's how you actually do a Taylor series. That is actually how to take the derivation. And I thank you all for watching this. Um, if you have any questions, hopefully I can answer them. Um, I'm actually uh, I'm actually kind of proud of myself to be honest with you. Um, it's been a long time since I've, had, I've, I've done a lot of this stuff. People don't seem to realize that uh, you know I have had some education. Um, I don't I don't uh, talk about it often, but <laughs> when when the, when the you don't uh, want to brag, you don't well, want to brag. That's it, what it's. It, it's it's just like you know the crowd car posse and these other people that kind of they, they, um, talk about us. They don't realize what we actually had. They don't realize what Drag has educated himself with, what Sam has educated himself with, what Jade yeah. has educated himself. We, we, and I will say this, and again, I usually self, I usually very self-deprivating. Uh, we are ethically and eons beyond their level on a lot of things. And I will be happy, and I'm sure everybody else would be, to try to raise people up to the understanding this kind of stuff. Yeah. And that's what I like to have happen in the Greek big community. <clears throat> that includes the, the clan Posse and everybody else, but you know they don't seem to want to learn. But the mere fact that I was able to, to actually, in a day, make this presentation and go over it, I can guarantee, unless you've had this before, you would not be able to do this. So, well, I mean, you know, Steve, it's like, it's like riding a bike. You know what I mean? You never really forget. <laughs> oh, you do. <laughs> I had, I, had I, I, t I tell you what, I had to go. I, I remember this. I, I think I could do this, but, but, but it's something that shows that obviously you know I'm not just talking my my ass. I've actually had some maths, but I'm not at the level like EO. But the fact <coughs> that EO admired that I was able to make it through this that means a lot to me. I'm not gonna lie, it means a lot, a lot to me. Thank you, EO. So we got any questions on that? Yeah, oh, I'm just gonna talk about that, by the way. I'll just say. Um, Great presentation, and you showed that the power series converges to e to the x for every real number x. To your point, we're happy to learn from anybody. If anybody from the internet wants to present an area of their expertise, I'm sure we'd all show up too, right, Drag? Oh, of course. I mean, it's, it's, I can't tell you how much stuff that I've actually learned from folks you know, like Jay, like Fiona, two people who are Christian, by the way. Um, but just so I have to know a lot about math and science and some of the other topics there in, we're interested in. And hell, after this, I think uh, Richard's supposed to be hosting something on his theological position, I think, for contingency, if I'm not mistaken. So That's going to be interesting. Hey, you know, but Jack, let me ask you a quick. Um, honestly, you know, you and I have known each other for a while. Um, and I, I, it's going to sound weird, but are you, are you a little bit surprised I was actually able to do something along those lines? I mean, I know that you know my background, but I don't ever talk about this stuff. I've never, I don't give presentations on this stuff. The last one I did was a Plonium Halo stuff, but are you, are you at least kind of a little bit surprised that I'm actually <laughs> not Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm I, not. I mean, I do. you know, it was at least Calc 2. And uh, I, you know, for 20-something years, yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. You can kind of just pick it back up in a few days 
and go back over it and work through a Taylor series and then well, like go I said, the running a bike. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so well, what do you guys want to see next? Harder. What do you guys want to see next? I mean, I'm, oh, I'm, wait, I'm wait, enjoying wait, this wait. stuff. So what, what yeah, do you guys there, want to see me do next there, in the next there, presentation there, tomorrow or the next okay. day? Okay. Uh, the Taylor Monday. series of the sign function or cosine. You know what I mean? Uh, do you, you guys want to continue with Ty? Do you guys want? To, well, first of all, I hate Trig. Trig is my weak point. I'll leave Trig for other, other people. But there are there are certain tier list series for, for for sine and cosine and all that. But do you guys want to stick with Taylor series, or do you want to learn something else in mathematics that is kind of an interest? Well, I leave it for the audience to decide, or whether they want us to handle the topic. I know that once I get into Chem two, I'll have a little bit more better. Uh, I will have a better background in chemistry, so I can. Probably talk a little bit more about that because I know King Crocodile wanted to hear about that. But, uh, you know, maybe me and Andreas could do something because I know he's taken biochem recently. That'd be awesome. What's wrong with – there was something wrong with Mike. But, Steve, do you, do you know anything about matrices? I can do some matrices, sir. You want to you you go over matrices next time? How about we do hey, matrices? I'm learning. Learning. Yeah. All right. Um, do you, have you heard of something called uh, Kramer's Rule? Uh. There you go. How about we, that? EO, you want to go all cool? the, sure, but you want to go all the way to determinants and that before introducing linear operators? You'd be jumping right in the middle of things. Uh, well, yeah, no, I mean, obviously, yeah, I'm not going to jump right into Kramer rule, but I mean, if you want to do like, how to determine it, the deter, how do you how do you find the determinant of a matrix? Um, what a matrix actually is. Now, again, that is going back even that is going back a long freaking time. That is going back to 1992 <coughs> for me. So. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? Uh, you know what, Steve? I can see your dream project. You could start with matrices, and then you know work up to tensors, and then you and you and uh, Han Solo could solve Einstein's field equations. Yeah, well, you, you mean go over? I'm sure. Hang on a sec. Um, one sec. Okay, continue on. Can you give me a minute. All sure. Right, so, well, so fellas, hmm? do you guys do you guys know oh, what's yeah, the birthday problem? Midnight, Andreas. The birthday problem. Mm -mm. Okay, so the next time you're in a group of 23 or more, you with me? 23 is the magic number. You guys with me? Yes. Okay. Feel free to make a bet. If it's 23, make a small bet. If it's 30, make a ver as much money as you have in your bank. This is how it works. Imagine you're at a party and there are at least 23 people. What are the odds that any two people will have the same birthday? Now, be clear, I'm not saying someone will have the same birthday as you, but any two people in the group will have the same birthday. You guys with me? Well, I mean, I guess you could say it's 1 in 23, but it's probably wrong. No, there are 365 days in a year, right? Well, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. So this turns out to be one of those cool things with what Steve mentioned last time with the product uh, symbol. Most people think that you need a really huge number like 182, but it turns out that's not how it works. How it works is, okay, the odd – of two people not having the same birthday or one minus 364 or 365 times 363 or 364 if you follow the, the logic I'm using. But anyway, it turns out um, we can do a presentation next time where if you have just 23 people in the room, there's a 52% chance that any two of them have the same birthday. And if you get all the way up to 30, there's like a 95% chance. Really? It's very counterintuitive, yeah. And what's cool is people who aren't who don't know the argument will say, no way, man, you need 182, like half of 365. You follow? And so yeah. you could win. You could easily win a bet, Drag. That's interesting. That's very interesting. The math is actually easier than what Steve showed today, and we can, you know, we could do that next time if you'd like. Or, this is actually, you yeah. know what's funny is this is this is kind of high-level math that we did. You guys, if you guys understood what, what I just said, you guys are way well, ahead of some of it, yeah. Some well, of you it. You don't have to like master it. No, well, but I mean, I mean I, that's because if you know how a, a derivative works, I mean, it's just doing a series of derivatives and then you know defining the uh, understanding what the proof is. I mean, I, I don't. I, you just, you can, you're just finding the derivatives and evaluating it at zero. That's it. That's okay. all you're really doing. Now, again, I would, I, I would love, and I would let them if, if, if True and Pearson ever wanted to come in and give a lecture on something like this, I would be totally down for it. I would listen. Um, or somebody along those lines. I'm I'm all game for that. Um, but let's let's do matrices next time. Um, I, I again I have to do some refreshing work on it, and I'm, I know there's a lot of people that can do it better than I can. But the thing with with the problem I'm going to run into with matrices, you know, and maybe you can add some insight on this. Is it difficult? Do you think for them to jump into matrices without learning linear equations first? Yes. In other words, I wouldn't yeah. because otherwise they'll have no connection to what they're doing. Right. Um, that that's that's the issue that I see. 
because it's going to be disjunctive, it, you know, kind of if they, they're not going to understand the relationship of matrices to solving a set of linear equations. So how about instead of doing matrices first, how about um, I do more of a presentation on solving a set of linear equations? That'd be great. You know what, here, Steve, a great problem okay. that, you know, from ancient times, um, there are chickens and sheep in a yard. There are, and the total number of animals is X and the total number of legs is Y. How many of each animal are there? So you have two unknowns and you need two equations. And like that, you can really motivate the discussion. It's, it's a lot of fun. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, yeah, I'll think about something. Um, and eventually, like, because linear equations, they, they, they're kind of easy for the most part. I mean, you know, but we can do linear equations and then we can do matrices. And then at some point, I really would like to get in differential equations. But unfortunately, that's where my, ex, you know, my, my <laughs> I'm about to say expertise. I have no expertise in this area. I'm not a mathematician. Quote, unquote, expertise. <laughs> well, that's so my knowledge level. I can yeah. do very simple differentials. If you give me something like what is dy dx equals like negative y over x, I can solve that one because I know it's a first order partial, excuse me, first order um, separable, 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 homogeneous yeah. linear equation, uh, excuse me, differential equation. Those are pretty easy to solve. Once you leave that, <laughs> then I'm like, oh, gee. So, See, can and, I make a suggestion? Do you remember sure. that, that young man you had during one of those last after shows? He was a stats teacher. He was yes. excited to meet you. Yes. What you should do is have him on and discuss confidence intervals. And I mean this because it's really important people understand why polling works. In other words, the population of the United States, the voting population is about 200 million, I want to say. Yet, mm -hmm. phone samples are only about 800 to 1,100. And so we can easily explain to people why that is. And that might be a good lecture to have. I mean, I, I would leave, I would leave that to somebody else, though. I, I, I do not even want to dive into to, to to statistics, even though I had statistics and I and I and I understand confidence intervals, that that's like Sam would be really good to give something like that. If he, but I don't think he's really you know interested in giving those lectures. But uh, somebody along the lines of like or hog tie, I don't like stats, so I would not be somebody that enjoys um, doing that kind of like uh, presentation. But I think you're how right. About teaching, how about teaching Edgar the Pythagorean theorem without shaming him? Let's just bring him in and show him how to do a few examples. Who uh, Edgar? Or anyone who wants to learn. I mean, this is fun. Well, I mean, like I said, if anybody else wants to, to pick up the the, 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 the torch and, and and do something, the channel's open here. It's a great to make community. Uh, we don't have a lot of viewers in this channel. We, a, lot, a lot of people know we, we have a separate channel. But this is where I want these kind of things to be so people can learn. And when people say, oh, well, you know, people don't learn anything on Steve's channel. Well, okay, well, you can believe that all you want. But at the same time, come over here. We're, we're educating you on something. You know. Yeah. All right, well, so that sounds good. Okay. All right. So, anyways, let's let's end this. Um, I will work on a thing for linear equations. Excuse me. Um, and then matrix, and then like I said, somebody. You know what? I. I you know what? Maybe I should challenge somebody like Drag. Maybe he can do. Uh, maybe he can explain a presentation of very simple quadratic equations because that would help because of of, of defining the determinant or uh, things like that. Um, sure. If you do, if you if you explain maybe qua uh, quadratics. That would actually be okay. Uh, very simple ones. You I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to do them for uh, for Kim too. Actually, that's part oh, yeah. of the, um, oh, you have part to of learn, solving you, problems. You're you're never gonna get out of school without <laughs> not having to learn quadratic equations. It's yeah, I mean, I, I I got the fucking formula memorized for some reason. I don't know why. I didn't do it intentionally, but uh, <laughs> I think I, I think toward middle school, then when I start getting high school, is when. Um, it started getting really ingrained into my mind. So yeah. it's nice when you don't have to use it, though. There's a lot yeah. of times where you don't have to use it. And it's like, oh, well, this is simple. I can just do this, but done. But yeah. Well, I think that it's not the hardest part. Isn't really, you know, transforming. And I didn't think the by the way, not the determinant. But, oh, I mean, but it's like to to, to actually apply the formula is not really the hardest thing. Is to determine because you end up getting two values, and so determining which value is the correct one. When if you're trying to determine like a distance or something, obviously you're not going to have a negative distance. But you you right. yeah. you would be surprised who picks the uh, the negative number. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. Um, you know, you have to you have to think of these things in real world applications sometimes, right? Um, even though they, you're going to often you're going to you're going to have two roots, right? Um, but if you if you can like do a presentation where you can show somebody what the, the discriminant is, do you remember what, what that part of the equation is? Uh the discriminant. Uh not that. Oh wait, not, wait, wait, wait. Do you wait, remember the on. quadratic formula, Drag? Yeah. Do you know the yeah, quadratic formula? Yeah, I remember the that. Okay. The B, hold on. Uh, Oh, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, okay. of course. Okay. It's everything under the radical. So everything under the radical, which would be b squared uh, minus four ac, that's called the determinant, right? Discriminant. No, it's called the yeah, Sorry, discriminant. Yeah, <laughs> the determinant is for matrix. Um, that, but you got yeah. to remember that if it's zero, that, that's it's 
Sorry, Steve. Go ahead. That, that, that formula that you have memorized, there's actually a general formula for that. It's a lot easier to memorize. It's real simple, actually. It's nobody will never forget this. This is a x squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. That's the general form of any quadratic for quadratic, quadratic equations. Um, and and, yeah, and, and you learn, it makes sense answer. why that actually is. But you well, just take the formula. A it's a the x squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Oh. Yeah, that's so. That's it. Basically, lines up all your variables so that you can apply the formula to begin with. It it, you, it it makes a lot of sense when you start there because you're just you. you one of the things you learn in like college algebra way back when you learn how to to actually plot a function. For example, if I say what is the the function x of is x squared, you when you plot that, if you've ever you've had math, you know you, 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 exactly you're going to get a parabola. And where where's the where's the apex of that parabola going to be? Uh, if, if, it's, if it's x squared, the ape, if okay, wait, do you mean vertex or vertex? vertices? Or yeah, vertices, vertices. Oh, uh, zero, zero. Zero, zero. So it's basically <laughs> on zero, zero of the x, y of the Cartesian coordinate system, right? So when you when you start mapping these things out, and maybe somebody else might want to do a presentation on this, um, when you start adding things to that, when I add a, a, a coefficient, when I add x squared plus 2, all I'm doing is I'm changing either the, the position of the parabola with respect to to the axes, or yeah. the um, the degree at which the parabola opens up or closes. I was ex eccentricity. Is that what's called EO? If I remember correctly. No, you're trying. To, the, it does have eccentricity, but you, you meant whether if it's if the leading coefficient is positive, it opens upward. If the leading coefficient is negative, that it opens yeah, downward. That's right. The, the way it's the way. It, that's exactly. So you know what right. I found? <clears throat> there's a there's a. So, so if it's x squared of a positive coefficient, it's going to open like a U, and if it's in, if it's a negative coefficient, it's going to go the other way like uh, upside down U. Yeah, you know, you know what I always yeah. found weird. Sorry to interrupt you. Not the, the track. Like, you know, like, 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 say you have uh, one, you know, one divided. You know, let's say one divided by fifty x squared. You know, it, 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 it actually opens up the parabola. You know, it makes it, it makes it wider. Yeah, what, I, I, I forget. What, yes, I forget what changes that. What, what changes that? I know. I mean, I, I remember doing shifting, right? The inflection of the parabola, the shifting of it. What actually changes the? Uh, Right, so yeah. we have vertical stretches, vertical compressions, horizontal yes. stretches. But so, midnight to your point, yes, it does flatten it out, but you can change the scale because, and that's a good point. When we're dealing with the limit, all that matters is the power, not the coefficient. So, in other words, if you want to compare x squared to x squared plus 50 million x plus 3, as you go to infinity, they look like the same function. And I mean, the limits, if you divide one by the other, the limit will still be the ratio of the leading coefficients. This is really technical, sorry. But my point is, all that matters for polynomials is the leading sorry is the degree of the polynomial anything else after that doesn't matter in terms of growth <clears throat> yeah so growth. Uh, for the parabolas you're, you're, for x squared you're going to probably but for like x cubed you're going to end up with that that shape that i showed you people earlier it's going to approach from the left it's going to have that little um you know turn it's going to go back turn the other way and then continue on as it goes yeah. from the left to the right so you learn all these minimum and these maximums and um newtons you have to, you have to find the roots right but that all—that's all college algebra stuff. So, oh, we're gonna—we're gonna be over in about one minute here. So we have a question in the chat. Uh, what has Taylor done? Uh, wait, what Taylor had done was to reverse the process from known constant to arrive with the basic assumption of derivatives. That's for Mr. ID. Wait, what? What? Edgar is a is that? Okay, now now I'm lost. What? I'll, I'll copy and paste it in the <clears throat> chat. Hey, Maybe we had our you. first ban. We had our first ban on the Great Debate Community. Yay! Oh, they're trying to do uh, yeah. spamming. If you if you ever see anything like that, where somebody's I'm not, don't don't say what was said. But if you ever see anybody saying those kinds of things, don't even wait. Just ban them right off the bat. I don't care who. Okay. It is. Yeah. Just wait. Ban what? Them. Don't don't. Yeah, worry I, was, about it. I was too busy reading Mr. Matter. ID's uh, yeah. comment. I'm trying to don't understand. Don't even get Edgar in here. No, we we have to end. we have people coming in. Yeah, all right. We're yeah, at our, we're at our threshold of beer, but uh, I'm I really want to do more of these things. I actually enjoyed this, guys. Thank you. I know we only had ten viewers, um, and I want people to realize it's not just for the views, it's not just for the Patreon, it's not just for the the um, uh, you know the uh, amount we get from making videos, which you know actually it's, it's actually not that bad lately. It's not great. I mean, a couple bucks a day adds up, right? But I did this because I enjoyed it, right? And I think yeah, that's yeah. why we all do things. Yeah. Yeah, and so I want people to realize that you know that, that we do we do these things because we enjoy it. I go to my channel because we enjoy it. Um, 
But if anybody ever asks you, you know, what from the great community, community you know, they, that you can learn, just return them back to this kind of stuff. Um, I never want to hear, you know, Ronnie or, or G Man or any of these guys say that we don't explain, you know, we don't educate people because we, we, we this is what the great big community is going to be doing it's educating people on this type of stuff and from a very basal kind of point of view a very lay person's kind of point of view because i think that a lay person could explain it like myself that somebody can understand it and these get the get the gist right this is not going to make you a master of math but it's a gist you know anybody like eo or general han solo could do this but i think it's cool that i can and when they say that i don't have any education or that i know what i'm talking about just refer back to this or my polonium halo stuff Clearly, I'm not a complete moron. But anyways, guys, thank you for watching. And um, Richard, I know you're going to have your hangout next, so people keep watching. And 